on chapter 10, 22 through 42. And we're looking at John's Gospel, sermon number 22. I'm going to invite you to follow with me. Take some notes if you need to. There's a lot of rich content that we're going to look at today. And if you don't follow along, you're going to get lost. I want to take you with me by the hand if, if need be, spiritually speaking. But follow along with me because we're going to look at two of the massive, major, fundamental doctrines of our Christian faith. And, we're, and if you want to write them down, this is what they are. We're going to look at the Trinity and we're going to look at the perseverance of the saints. These are two doctrines for which men have died, have bled, have given their life to defend, to uphold, to to pass on to the next generation through the preaching of the Word of God. And we're going to look at this today, uh, just following along in the text. As you know, we've been going verse by verse through John's Gospel, and today we find ourselves in John 10, 22. For some context, we see Jesus having done several miracles, and let's interact a little bit. What was the first miracle that John talks about that Jesus did? Water into wine at a wedding. We saw other miracles like Jesus feeding how many? 5,000 plus their families, about 20,000 people. We saw another miracle of Jesus walking on the water. We saw all kinds of miracles. And then last week, we saw another miracle, Jesus giving sight to a man born blind. Now, again, following the context here, we find Jesus back at the temple. I think we have a little image there of the temple. And Jesus has been debating, arguing with the religious leaders of the day. They didn't like what he had to say. They didn't care for his miracles. They thought that was a work of the devil. And as we find ourselves here today, they're finding him once again, just to keep messing with him, to keep picking at him. And so we find ourselves in John 10, 22 through 23. Why don't we read that together by way of introduction, and we'll get right to work because we have a lot of content to look at today. Let's read it all together, John 10, 22 and 23. It says this, Then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. So months have passed after Jesus healed that man born blind. And now we find ourselves in the wintertime. For those of you who have never gone to Israel, I never have either. But Israel, around the wintertime, it's very similar to Brownsville, Texas, actually. And in the sense of that uh, you have the ocean breeze coming in from the Mediterranean, you have that cool weather of 50s and 60s, which to us, we're already like putting on big coats and jackets, right? And And I was telling the people in the morning, like, I grew up in North Carolina. We had snow up to here. It was actually cold up there, not this cold down here. But we find ourselves in the winter. And question, what do the Jews celebrate in December? Not Christmas, but what do they celebrate? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. And what is the symbol of Hanukkah? The menorah, right? This lamp stand. uh, And they are lighting one of these lamps every single day. So that's what the festival of dedication was. I want you to know where we are in the Bible, who Jesus was talking to. The festival of, of dedication was Hanukkah. And what did the Jews celebrate in Hanukkah? Well, as you know, the Jewish people have, were always being conquered by different nations. And in 164 BC, before Christ, they were conquered by a, the Syrian army. And there was the great leader of the Syrians, and let me get his name before I butcher it, Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay? Antiochus Epiphanes. And who was this guy? What did he do? He went into the temple of God. We have the image. Let's go back to the temple here. And if you see here, the innermost part was considered the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where once a year the high priest got to go and worship God and see the glory of God there, the the light of God. This man, Antiochus Epiphanes, he goes into the temple, he kills the priest, he puts a pig on the altar, slaughters a pig, which was an unclean animal for the Jewish people, and then he declares himself to be a god, and he sets up an altar to himself and to other false gods. And so the Jewish people felt abandoned. And in Hanukkah, the festival of dedication, what happened? And a small army of Jews went up, slaughtered Antiochus Epiphanes, and they killed all of his soldiers. They took back the temple, and they rededicated the temple back to God. And that's where we are, again, in the context. Jesus here is talking to these people on Hanukkah, on the day of Hanukkah. Now, what can we learn here? They had been pursuing Jesus for months, to get after him. And what do we learn? That evil never rests. No matter how long you live on this earth, there's going to be problems because we have a very real enemy. His name is Satan. We know who Satan is, a fallen angel with his demons. So even when you feel like, okay, here comes one wave. I'm going to endure it and I'll be fine. Waves keep coming, my friend, because we live in a broken, fallen world where evil does not sleep. The good news is this. God doesn't sleep either. And he watches over us. But we see this, they're pursuing Jesus to try to put him to death. 
And imagine this, if they would have killed Jesus before he made it to the cross, we would not have salvation. The plan of God was for Jesus to suffer on the cross, die on the cross, resurrect from the, the dead. But if Satan could have killed Jesus before then, that would have been the end of salvation. No salvation for us. Now, do you remember other times where Jesus was almost put to death or almost killed? Talked about it in the morning. When he was a baby. Remember the slaughter of the innocents? Herod kills all the babies in that region. When uh, Jesus is in the middle of the storm, that was a storm that could have drowned Jesus Christ. And if he would have drowned there, that would have been the end. But remember something Jesus said last week and the week before. My hour has not yet come. It was not time for him to die yet. So that's the context. Now let's get into the text there in John 10, 24 through 29. And the first message or the first point we want to look at today is this. Jesus does the Father's works. Now let's take turns reading this in John 10, 24 to 29. The Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. 25. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And the question was asked last week. Are you a sheep of God? Is Jesus Christ your shepherd? Is he your pastor? He says, 27, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. 29. So Jesus tells these, these religious fools, and we can use that word because he used that word. He says, I came here to do the works of my father. Jesus didn't come to earth to set up a kingdom of uh, political rule. Jesus didn't come to start a nice religion to make everyone happy and rich. Jesus came to do the works of the Father. And what are some of those works? We're going to have them up here on the screen, and you can take some of these notes. The works of God for Jesus were this. Number one, to show mercy. Jesus is the perfect example of someone showing mercy. Because what is mercy? It's when you give, something, give someone something they don't deserve, or... When they deserve something, you withhold it from them because it would hurt them. For example, a criminal going to jail, mercy, or, or let's back up a little bit. Let's say you getting a speeding ticket. How many speeders do we have in this room today? Raise your hand if that's you. If you've ever gotten a ticket, what speed were you going at, brother, over here? Do you remember still? Not that much, maybe five miles over the limit on this side, ticket? Probably like 10 miles over the limit. You know, um, when I was going to start pastoring at Port Isabel, uh, it was, I think, the first week, and Carlita can tell you this, but you know when you, get, when you get to Port Isabel, all of a sudden the speed drops from 70 to like 40? I was still going 70. I had 30 miles over the limit. Mercy would have been the officer pulling me over and saying, ah, oh, pastor, it's your first day. It's okay, go preach the word of God. He didn't show me mercy. I got that $300 ticket and I had to pay it. That was a lot, so don't speed. But the work of God for Jesus was to show mercy to people. How did he do that? By performing miracles that he didn't have to do. Remember, the man who was born blind, Jesus was on his way out of Jerusalem. He didn't have to stop for this guy, but he stopped. The woman who was caught in adultery, thrown at his feet, he could have stoned her to death. He didn't. He had mercy on her. The question for me to you is this. How has God shown you mercy, my friend? Lately, in your whole life, what has God protected you from withheld from you that you deserved or what has God given you that you absolutely know you did not deserve number two what is the work of God to call the sheep God sent Jesus to go call his sheep out of the world call them to what call them to repentance to abandon their sin number two call them to faith after they abandon their sin don't just make yourself a better person follow me have faith in Jesus what else the call to service how many of you have a ministry here at the church? Raise your hand if you have some form of ministry that you're serving in currently. Okay? We all do something. Even if it's read, even if it's picking up a piece of trash here in the building, we all serve in one way or another. We help out. When God calls you to follow Him, not only does He save you, does He forgive you, He calls you to serve Him now for the rest of your life. What else does He call you to do? This is the one that might be hard for you to understand. But God is calling you to die. Okay? 
God is calling you to die. Question, what percentage of people on the, in the world die? A hundred. A hundred. Everyone's going to die. And the question is this, is your death going to mean something? Is your death going to mean something? When Jesus tells people to follow Him, He says this, Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Me. And we explain this in the morning. Well, we use that phrase, pick up your cross, too loosely sometimes. Well, we say, oh, this very nagging wife, oh, that's my cross that I have to bear for the rest of my life. That's not the cross. Oh, this nail in my toe that's always growing in, oh, that's my cross to bear. We use this very loosely, and that's kind of offensive to the cross of Christ. When he says, pick up your cross, what he's literally saying is, the way they're going to kill me, you better be ready to die too. Because you follow me and you're not more than your master. So Jesus calls his sheep to go die for him. Some of you, I'm not saying all of you, and I'm not saying the majority of you, but some of you, God might call you to go do missions somewhere else, where it's life or death to go do them, those missions. And if those missions, if you're discovered to be a Christian in a country that's prohibited Christianity, they might put you to death. My job as your local church pastor is to prepare you for that day. Your job is to follow Christ even till the end. So He calls you to even die for Him, if need be. Not everybody, not everybody will. John the Apostle, he didn't die of martyrdom even though they tried. He died of old age, praise God. But God might call some of you to that. And the question is this, do you remember when God called you? Do you remember when God called you to follow Him? Was it through a really good sermon? Was it through a brother just talking about Jesus with you? Was it you almost dying in a car accident and you said, okay, that's enough, I get it, you called me, I'm going to belong to you now. What was your calling? Number four, what else is the work of God? Jesus was sent to give us eternal life. Okay? Um, let me ask a young guy, Paul, 18. What age would you say, you know what, if I die at this age, I think I lived a pretty good life. Humanly speaking, let's not get all spiritual, just plainly speaking, if you say, because some people, oh no, whatever age he wants, that's sometimes not true. If God were to tell you, you know, how many days do you want, what would you say? Oh wow. You think like that's it? <laughs> okay, okay. Jose Angel, what age would you say I lived a good life? Humildemente. <laughs> Well, you see, we think of here, right? We think like this is, that's like a very long life. And think about this. God is eternal. There is no time limits on Him. And because He's given us as a gift eternal life, we will be eternal with Him. Immortal. Not that we're God's, but He will grant us eternal life. Grant us to never die again. What does that mean? Remember the thief on the cross? He looks to Christ and he says, I know I deserve to be up here for my crimes. He probably killed someone. But remember me when you come in your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. It's amazing. Eternal life means you'll be with Jesus forever. Eternal life means you will never go to hell or even experience hell. And uh, I know we joke around. We have our, our, our humor. Let's not joke about hell. It's not funny. People are really going there. People are really there right now, burning, suffering, and not saying, oh, I'm sorry, God, take me out of here. But it says that in hell, they're still cursing God. Eternal life means we'll never see that or experience that. And that's something Jesus came to do. And lastly, what did Jesus come to do as the work of God? He came to protect and guard the sheep. And that's you, if you've put your faith in Christ. He guards the sheep. He says there in verse 28, I give them eternal life, they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. We're going to talk about a big doctrine today, the perseverance of the saints. If you follow Calvinism, the, you know, the five uh, letters of Calvinism, TULIP is the acronym, P is the last one, perseverance of the saints. And this is what it is, that God will make sure that if you are a Christian, on the, your deathbed, you're still a Christian, so that you'll be with Him forever. A lot of people have taught this falsely, 
that as a Christian you can lose your salvation. And we'll talk about that for a second. Let's see first what the Word of God has to say before I say what I have to say. Romans 8, 31 through 39. And this is one of the most powerful, beautiful chapters of the Bible, Romans 8. I encourage you to go read it this week. But this is the conclusion that Paul comes to regarding the security of our salvation. Okay? Why don't we take turns reading this? Romans 8, 31 through 39. We'll have it up for you on the screen. This is what it says. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 32. Okay. 33. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. 34. So what does Paul say there? Number one, you're chosen by God. Number two, no one can take you out of God's hand because, you know, who can bring accusations? And then he says, number three, Jesus died and now he's interceding for you. I know uh, Brother Richard, he, he's been to a lot of court proceedings, even recently, right? And he gets to see defense attorneys trying their best to twist and get close to almost twisting the law to get their client to get off scot-free if they can, right? I used to work in bell bonds, and I was saying this in the morning, that my job was to make sure they showed up to court that day. And I would see some of the defense attorneys. I would stick around. They had the evidence. They had everything to convict <laughs> this criminal of what he had done. And somehow, the attorney was able to get him off with only six months probation and maybe 30 days of time served in jail. And that was it for something that, like, how is he out free right now? That's a good attorney. And the Bible tells us Jesus is our great attorney. That even as a Christian, when you sin, it's not that you lose your salvation, He steps in for you. And He says, oh yes, Father, I also died for that too. Intercedes. What else does the Bible say there in uh, Romans 8, uh, 35? Why don't you go ahead and read that for me nice and loud. Who can separate us? As it is written, because of you, God, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. 37. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, which is demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the conclusion Paul comes to. If you truly belong to Christ, if you've been saved, born again, if the Holy Spirit now lives in you truly, nothing, and what he means by nothing is, nothing can separate us from the love of God. This is not a poem to feel, oh, this is a beautiful poetry. This is a reality. Nothing can separate us from the love of God if we truly have salvation. But that's the question. Do you really have it? It's a big if. This is what the Bible teaches. If you belong to Christ, you will never lose your salvation. But some people can fake it. Some people are very good at faking a religious lifestyle. Have we not seen that even within ourselves? So let's examine that for a second. Because Jesus is talking about my sheep know my voice, they hear my voice and they follow me. What does a true Christian look like? Number one, a true Christian never truly walks away from God. You might wander a bit. You might fall into some things willingly or unwillingly. But a true Christian always wants to come back to God. Have you lived through seasons like that? And we said this in the morning. It's not, oh, I prayed the prayer when I was six. And then from six to 20, I walked away from God. And then at 20, I came back to God. No, my friend, you probably were never saved at that time. You probably truly got saved when you were 20. Because that's when you truly came to follow Jesus. But a true Christian will never truly walk away from God. If we see people who, I mean, there's so many stories of people who started out in churches, even reading the text, and then they went on to become militant atheists. What happened there? They were never born again. And the Bible even tells us they went out from us because they were never truly of us. Number two, a true Christian, what does he do? He hates the sin that separates him from God. What is your sin? 
What is your temptation that you struggle with? Not everybody suffers the same temptations. Some people are stronger in some areas than others. For some people, this is not every, even a temptation. For somebody else, this is my whole life that I have to struggle with. But what is your temptation? What is your sin? And the question is this, if you're examining your heart to see if you're really a Christian, do you hate that sin? Do you despise it because it separates you from your master, from your Lord, from your Father, from your God? That's what a true Christian lives like. Number three, a true Christian loves Jesus Christ above everything and everyone. Jesus said this, If you do not love me more than your mother, more than your father, more than your brother, your sister, more than your wife, more than your children, you're not worthy of me. That's a very, very hard flag to be planting in the ground and saying that's what it's, it means to be a Christian. He says, if you don't love me above everything, including your own life, you're not worthy of me. That's a hard call, isn't it? For those of you who have children, would you give up your child to go follow Christ? You would say, please don't make me do that. There's been cases where, especially in the Middle East, where let's say a young person gets saved and it's a Muslim country. He says, hey, I belong to Jesus now. I'm going to follow Jesus, Isa. What, will they, what does the family do? If they reject Jesus, they'll hold a uh, mock funeral for them. They'll do a funeral. Our son is dead to us. We are disowning him. He's not part of our family. He just brought shame to us. You know what? He, he's dead to us. They'll literally hold a funeral. Jesus said, if you love me above everything and everyone else, then you are worthy of me. And I'll ask you that. Do you? Do you love God? Do you love not just some word of God or just some uh, God out there? Do you love Jesus Christ above everything and everyone else? When Carlita and I started dating, we shared this in the morning, I told her and she told me kind of at the same, around the same time, I want you to love God more than you love me. Because then if you love God, I know you'll love me the way I'm supposed to be loved. And that was, that was our, our, what do you call it, our rubric. That was our guide. That was our, our way of knowing if this is the person I want to pursue. Is, do you love God more than you love me? What else? A true Christian loves the things that Jesus loves. Again, I want to say thank you for reaching out to Janeth. Thank you for reaching out to Ugo since he lost his father. And what I said in the morning was this, that you want to show me that you love me, Manny Martinez? Love the people that I care about. Love them. And that shows me that you love me. And you've done so, and I thank you for that. The same thing here. If you love Jesus, you love the things that He loves. And what does He love? He loves His church. He loves His imperfect, messy, sinful, sometimes wandering away people. He loves His people. Do you love the church? Do you love Logos Baptist Church here our, our local community? Do you love your Christian brothers all around the world? Or are you someone who's like, I don't want to go to church because everybody steals there, everybody's judging me, everybody's a hypocrite, yes, including you. Do you love the church? What else does Jesus love? He loves truth. What is truth? You live honestly. You don't live a double life, a secret life. You walk in honesty. You're honest about who you are and your shortcomings so that God can help you with them. What else does Jesus love? He loves justice. When you do what's right, even when no one's watching. And lastly, a true Christian wants to please his master in everything he does. So we said this. Every decision that we make as Christians, before we make that decision, we think about this. Is it going to please Christ? Is he pleased with me? If you were standing right with me, which the Holy Spirit lives in you, if you were standing right in front of me, would I be doing the same things that I'm doing right now? Would I be laughing about the same things I'm laughing about now? Would I be enjoying the things that I'm enjoying right now if Christ were literally physically standing right next to me? For a lot of us, the answer is no. We would be ashamed. And the Bible says this, Blessed are those who are not, who are not ashamed at His return. He, he will return at any moment, my friends. We need to know this. Have this sense of urgency about you. Christ will return. 
The Bible says that with the, the shout of an archangel, we'll hear the trumpet. That'll be the day we return. He returns and we go to be with him. He sets up the new kingdom, rules the world, judges the nations. Will you be embarrassed when he returns? Will you be ashamed of the way you're living when he returns? Or are you like that parable that he gave of the ten virgins waiting for their groom to come marry them? Are you ready for your Christ to come save you? And there's nothing you need to delete off your phone real quick before anyone catches you. Are you living honestly? Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And that's the perseverance of the saints. You say, Pastor Manny, I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this. Here's the good news. He does it for you and through you. The fact that you're still here, it's not because you did it. It's because he's holding you in his hand and no one can take you out. That's great news. It takes his weight off of you. Of try harder? No, he already did it. And he has me in his hands. He won't let me go. That's the perseverance of the saints. Look at what Charles Spurgeon had to say about this. We have this little quote here. It says, The saints, and that's you, the saints shall persevere in holiness because God perseveres in grace. You say, I can't do it. He does it. He gives you grace and more grace and more grace. And then I put it simply in more uh, easy to understand terms. And we use this in next steps as well. A Christian cannot lose his salvation because God cannot lose a Christian. Simple as that. God has never lost a Christian. He, he's not going to start now with you. God has never lost a Christian. Jesus says, no one can take them out of my hand. So this is, a, this is the back and forth Jesus is having with these religious people there in the temple. And let's go back now to John 10, 30 through 33. As he's talking... Jesus claims something very important. He says this in John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up, says the Bible, picked up rocks to stone him. And Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? And they look at the response. We're not stoning. We're not going to kill you for doing your good works and miracles. Let me say this. No one's going to hate you for being a nice Christian out in the world. They don't care if you're a nice guy out there in the world, feeding the hungry, clothing the, those who need it. What do they say? We're not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. What did Jesus tell these people? He said, I and the Father are one. In other words, he's saying, I'm equal to the Father. In other words, I am God. That's what he was saying. So we're going to talk about the second big doctrine. Today you're getting a big, big meal. There's days where we get, we use this imagery, you get a snack. Today we're getting a big meal. So fill up. We're going to talk about the Trinity. And so here Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And they say they want to stone him for blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is whenever we insult or offend God. And how were they saying that Jesus was offending God? By him claiming to be God being a human being. If I were to say, I'm God, that would be offensive because you know my sin, I know my sin, I've told you my sin. That would be offensive. So here's two options. Either he was lying or he was telling the truth. Either he is God or he's a blasphemer who is insulting the holiness of God. Only two options. Now, something we need to know here They said, we're not killing you for good works. We need to know this, friends. Jesus didn't die for social justice. He didn't die for social causes. You know what social justice is? It's just the religion of the godless. That's all it is. Social justice is the religion of the godless. Jesus didn't die for that. Jesus didn't die for racial inequity. He didn't die to make black people and white people have peace in America. That's a byproduct. We should have peace among different ethnicities, but that's not why he died. Also, Jesus didn't die for a political revolution. He didn't die to make America great again. You should know that. And Jesus didn't die to keep America great either. Jesus died for your sins. And here by him saying, I and the Father are one, what was he doing? He was sealing his death sentence. Because they said, that's it. Nothing else you say matters, 
you are a blasphemer, you're going to die. He claimed to be God. And let me tell you this, this is why Christianity is so exclusive and so different from any religion in the world. Muhammad from the Muslims, he didn't claim to be God. Gandhi, the man who helped a lot of Indian people, but he had his own skeletons in his closet, he didn't claim to be God. Confucius, he didn't claim to be God. Joseph Smith didn't claim that he was God. And Buddha didn't claim that he was God. Jesus is the only religious leader who says, I am God. He makes that big claim. So let's talk about that. The Trinity. The Trinity is this. It's a mystery of God revealing Himself to us for who He is. And what has He revealed? That God is one God in three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, there's a Bible called the King James Version Bible, right? I grew up with that one, actually. But the godless have made a, another translation called the Queen James Bible. And there, they describe God as feminine, as she, her. God is not she, her. God is who He has revealed Himself to be, and that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you say, well, where do we see that in the Bible? Just listen in. Genesis 1 it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. One God is speaking amongst himself. We see this in Genesis 3, at the fall of man. The Lord God said, Since the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not reach out and eat from the tree of life and live forever. God is saying amongst himself, This man has become like one of us. Number three, in Genesis 11, at the time of the Tower of Babel, the whole world got together to try to go to heaven by themselves without God. Genesis 11, what does God say? Let us go down there and confuse their language so they won't understand each other. One God speaking amongst Himself. And lastly, in Colossians, it says this, God was pleased to have the fullness dwell in Jesus. In other words, God became a human being, Jesus Christ. The Trinity. There's two things you can do with the Trinity. Believe it, even though you don't understand it, or deny it. And what are the outcomes? If you receive it and believe it, you'll be saved. If you reject it and deny it, you'll be lost forever. Now, a couple things here about the Trinity. Number one, the Trinity is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. He can do all things, He knows all things, and He's everywhere all at once. That's only God. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking Satan is omnipresent, that the devil is everywhere. He's not. He's limited. Only God is truly omnipresent. And what do we do as a response to this? We worship Him. Number two, the Trinity is a perfect community within Himself of love and truth. The Father says in His prayer, Father, I love you. Father, give me the glory we had together before we created the universe. There's a perfect love and harmony there in the Trinity. And so how should we respond to that? We should pursue community with one another and with Him, fellowship with Him. Number three, the Trinity is a perfect example of humility. The Son is the one who sent into the world to do the works of the Father. Imagine if Jesus was selfish. No, I'm not going to die for these people. Father, I don't care what you have to say. He wasn't. He was humble. He submitted Himself to the Father. The Holy Spirit submits Himself to the Son, Jesus. You see, it's all perfect submission. So how should we respond? We should pursue humility as well. What else? The Trinity is a mystery for now, but one day we will know God fully. Right now we don't understand it. We don't get it. One, three, I don't understand it. And the Bible says this. It's because we're looking through a foggy mirror, through a foggy window, that's how we're looking into who God is. We don't fully get it, but we know He's right there. But it says one day when we die and go to be with Jesus, we will know Him as He knows us. How does God know you? He knows every cell of your being. And the Bible says one day we will know God like that. That's a gift. I don't get it. We don't deserve it. But we'll know God fully. I can't comprehend it. So that's the Trinity. And Jesus says, I and the Father are one, and as a result, they wanted to kill Him, put Him to death for claiming to be God. So let's wrap up with this. Ten, uh, John 10, 34 through 38. The last point is this. Believe the Son of God. Jesus answered them, 
Isn't it written in your law, I said, you are gods? Now, don't get lost on me. Follow along and I'll, I'll explain what this means. 35. If he called those to whom the word of God came, gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I'm the son of God? What is he saying here? In the Old Testament, God refers to the religious uh, rulers of the time as little g, gods, as rulers. That's what that word means. God means ruler. He says, you leaders who have the word of God with you and you're preaching it, you are like gods. You are rulers of this country of Israel. Here what Jesus is saying is, I'm not just a ruler of a country. I'm the son of God himself. That's what he's saying. Now, we continue there. 37. If I'm not doing my father's works, then don't believe me. And what a great thing that, let's pause there, right? What a great verse that we should test everybody else by who claims to work for God. If I don't do the works of God, don't believe me. All these prophets and preachers and something that really, really boiled my blood this week was seeing one of these revivals where the guy's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mary, God is telling me there's a Mary here who has some sort of sickness in her stomach. And then over here is a girl named Mary who ate some hot Cheetos yesterday. She doesn't feel well. Me, 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 preacher. Amen. God has a word for you, Mary. It's all a scheme. It's all a way to make money. And that's what I call spiritual child abuse. Taking all these young kids and feeding their mind full of false teaching. What if we tested everybody like this? If I'm not doing the Father's works, don't believe me, says Jesus. 38. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Jesus says, you don't believe what I say? Fine. Look at the miracles I've done. No one else could do these miracles. No one else has risen someone from the dead, has given literal new eyes to the blind, has fixed the legs of the paralytic who had never been able to walk their whole life. No one else did that. Only Christ. He says, believe me. Believe the works. And I need you to know this, my friends. By faith, God has adopted you into His family. Jesus is now your big brother. And you say, that feels weird to say. It's true. Our Father is God the Father now. Jesus is our brother by faith. We're part of this family. Jesus said, those who hear my Father's words and, and obey them, those are my brothers and sisters and mother and father. Family. So the closing point is this. He tells them, believe in me, and I tell you the same thing, friends. Believe him. And you say, I can't because I have questions. What are those questions? What are those doubts that you have about Jesus Christ? You say, well, I can't believe that Noah's Ark existed. I'll send you a link, really interesting documentary of where they think it is right now. You say, I can't believe that God came down to a mountain and spoke with Moses. The mountain was on fire. I don't believe it. I'll send you another link. That mountain's still there. What doubts do you have about God that you say, I can't believe? Ask them. God says this in the Old Testament, reason with me. Ask me the questions you have. Christianity is not a faith of just believe and shut up. It's ask the questions. Let us tell you why we believe this. So Jesus says, believe me. And we close with John 10, 39-42. That's the last verse of the day. It says this. Then they were trying again to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Once again, it wasn't his time to die yet. So he departed again across the Jordan River to the place where John had been baptizing earlier. And he remained there. So he left all the religious, big brain people. He goes across the river to the humble, to the poor, to the fishermen, to those that were just there waiting for something to happen. 41, what was the result? Many came to him and said, John never did a sign, John the Baptist, but everything that John the Baptist said about this man, Jesus, is true. And many believed in him there. Our God loves the lowly, the uneducated, the regular and working Joes, our God loves those who have a simple faith. God loves the rich. God loves the poor. He loves the famous and the infamous. He loves those that are important and those that are not important to society. God loves all of those. So my call to you and His call to you is believe. And you need to examine your heart today. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word that we received. Thank you for this uh, banquet of theology that we received today. We believe that we will persevere till the end because you will bring us to the end. And we believe, Lord, that you are Trinity, that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for salvation. We thank you, Jesus, for doing the works that you did. We thank you, Jesus, for being our shepherd, our pastor, guiding us wherever we need to go. And we ask that you forgive us for those that are Christians, Lord, for those things that break our fellowship with you momentarily. We ask that you would forgive us and put us on the right path again. And then I pray, Father, for those that are not Christians, those who have deceived themselves and tried to deceive others but cannot deceive you, that they would repent from their sins, that they would abandon their sins, that instead they, were, they would follow you, obey you, and more importantly, that they would love you, Lord Jesus, that your death on the cross would apply to their sins, paying all of them, and that your resurrection would be a model for their resurrection, that they will live forever. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you bless our church, that you finish the work that you're doing in our lives. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.